Well, hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing great. We are so happy to have you here in this space that we have kind of been co-creating in this pandemic that we are living. We have called it Wednesday Talks, and we will be meeting every Wednesday, same time, same channel, sharing beautiful reflections that hopefully may add some value and also some well-being to all of us in these moments. So to kick off this conversation that we will be enjoying with Dennis Sando and George Greenfield in just three minutes, I wanted to invite and to position here a brief reflection from our dear, dear friend, Umberto Maturana, and our dearest friend and relative as well, Jimena Davila. Uh, they invite us uh, to reflect about love. So a biologist talking about love. We are all kind of familiar with it, um, but it's peculiar. And what is Umberto inviting us to see when we talk about love? And in the last few years of conversations between Umberto and Jimena, uh, loving has come as a distinction to let appear. It is to let appear others and oneself from the legitimacy of what they are experiencing, from the legitimacy of their living. And many times we have seen love as the kind of hallmark postcard or the little heart, but it's not about that. It's about letting appear. It's about the, that particular disposition that scientists have to let things appear in front of them. And why are we talking about love in a context of reflections about the HP way, about productivity, about quality assurance? That is a tricky question, but thankfully we are joined here by Dennis Sando, collaborator of Matristica, dear friend, amazing representative of the Eugene living and culture, and our buddy George Greenfield, expert and, well, I, I, I distinguish him as an expert uh, and very knowledgeable person around quality assurance. And both Dennis and George share a beautiful experience of collaborating around uh, innovation in HP. So given that they are the one who had their experience, I will silence myself and give them the room to introduce themselves and to share with us three main insights, reflections that they have gotten for us to enjoy in this day. So Dennis George, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Sebi. Thank you so much. Uh, this, this space that we're in right now is a, a regular Wednesday uh, conversation space. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, because inside of uh, this conversation, we're all together and living an experience that we haven't really lived before. And with respect to uh, Oregon, for example, uh, we've been ordered by our governor to stay in our homes. And most everything has been closed down. I took my morning walk this morning and playgrounds are closed down. Uh, bathrooms are closed down with emergency bathrooms uh, replacing them. And what's really fascinating to me is what we typically let lie dormant in the background, our loving nature of caring for each other, putting other people first, being uh, respectful, wanting to live in freedom, mutual respect and health has come into the foreground. Uh, by now, 
uh, as a grandpa of a baseball player in high school, I should have eaten six packs of sunflower seeds. I should have yelled at the umpire a half dozen times for making a lousy call. And I should have been cheering uh, my grandson's best friend, Griffin, to throw out someone trying to steal second base because Griffin's the best baseball catcher there is. I don't get to do that anymore. That's gone. And that's happening to all of this. The things that we work for to live with our friends and our family and George enjoy barbecues, watching our grandchildren's uh, sports, being together, embracing each other. That world has changed for us. And while we are missing that opportunity to be together, we're finding that what Umberto and Jimena have been telling us in terms of their understanding is now becoming our understanding. We're social, and when we can't be social, we don't feel well. The other thing that I'm seeing, I don't know if this is Eugene, maybe not, um, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of caring for one another. We're not just sidelined and sitting, we're taking care of one another. Our grocery store around the corner from where I live is now bringing us our groceries if we're worried about getting the virus. But not only that, the owner of the store, Penny, is sewing surgical masks together while she delivers food to people who do not have it or cannot get to it. Uh, this loving is becoming very present in all of our lives. And the science of Umberto and Jimena have given us an explanation for quite some time that said this would be validated in our daily living. And once again, we find that it is. The other thing that excites me about this uh, conversation and particularly uh, about my friend George is we know how to live in social systemic change. I'm, for, I'm one of those that have talked about uh, social systemic change for a long time. In my experience in helping people with developmental disabilities leave institutions and go to communities, that was an experience of large scale social change. Now we're living in large scale social change and we can't do much about it. Biology is now affecting our capacity to be social. So as I, as I thought about this notion of letting the other appear, I, I was reminded of George Greenfield. Um, George and I are, um, are really good friends. Uh, we worked together uh, when he was uh, responsible for inkjet cartridge quality uh, programs for Hewlett Packard. And I was uh, beginning to study social collaboration, social network structures, and understanding the nature of our humanness. Uh, George and I were blessed with having Umberto come to the factory and give a course. And then uh, at the same time, I think we may have been at the first global matristic workshop in Chile together. And there was this braiding happening where we were learning about the nature of our humanness and we were seeing it happen in the workplace. And I, as I thought about these seemingly difficult trade-offs we have now, 
the economy versus our well-being, I quickly thought of George because in the work that he did at Hewlett Packard, he saved an extraordinary amount of money and kept the company from harm by letting others appear. And uh, I immediately um, called Sebe and said, you know, we've got to talk to George and I would love to hear his reflections. Um, I, we did that and I think both Sebe and I came away from that conversation saying, holy cow, this is a story of a practitioner who was greeting a very uncertain future with caring for others and others' well-being in his heart. And you'll get this from George in just a second. So I, I, I think that this notion of us talking about these times we're living in are inviting us to see that we're living in a new social relational domain that is bringing love forth in all of our communities. That nature's given us a pause where we can reflect. And when we reflect, uh, I just saw someone from Eugene come in. Hey, Chan. Uh, and I point to him because uh, he brings love into our community in a wide variety of ways, as well as his partner, uh, Christy Joe. And where that may have been trivial before, it's not trivial anymore. Uh, because when Chandler uh, and Christy Joe come to my sweetheart, Anastasia, and I and say, can we do something for you? We, are, we realize that they're coming to us out of many, many difficulties in their daily living. And for them to ask about our well-being when their well-being is an, as uncertain as anyone else is a powerful expression of love and caring. So we're, from my kind of odd view, we're in a gigantic social experiment now where those of us who are interested, curious about the biology of cognition, the biology of love and cultural biology, and those of us who are living in the pain of not being with those that we would prefer to be with and hug and uh, give high fives to. But we're now in a place to practice what we've been learning. In organization learning, I don't think I've ever learned as much about an organization's capacity to know than I have from uh, my friend George. So before I turn it over um, to George, um, I, I want to point out one other thing that's really wonderful and very interesting right now is George and I got together not on the coronavirus and not on cultural biology, but we got together as friends because George is on the board of a uh, health organization that uh, he'll, he'll tell you about through his introduction. And so as we listen to George reflect on these things um, uh, that, that he saw gained as insights during this time Umberto was coming up to the factory and the company was being challenged with some very serious quality issues. Uh, he now is reflecting on these insights that I think will have tremendous value for organizations adapting to the new biological reality we're living in. So um, uh, this is wonderful for me. I get to be with friends. And so I'm, you know, I'm biased and I'm blinded because I just love these guys. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know what else to say. They're just really wonderful friends. Other than uh, everyone, welcome George. 
Thank you. Let me introduce myself uh, a little bit. I retired, and I don't use that term very much anymore, from Hewlett Packard back in 2012. Um, quickly found out that there were many, many things to apply my time and energy to, and so I've been using the term refocused instead of retired. And I think that's a much better description of what happens after the formal career part of your life ends. Because at this point in my life, I wouldn't have time to work. Um, I'm so involved from things like Dennis mentioned, uh, serving on the board of trustees for the Cascade Medical Center, which is a, a rural health clinic, an emergency room, and a rural health hospital um, that services the city of Cascade of about a thousand people and the surrounding area, the surrounding taxing district of about 3,000 people. And we have 54 employees that service those 3,000 people. So very, very lucky to be able to work with those great people. On the other end of the spectrum, I teach tumbling four days a week at the cult, at the at the rec center to absolutely wonderful kindergarten and first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. So that is an absolute delight also. Um, and then everywhere in between, my wife and I serve a church and our primary callings are associated with the youth, primarily high schoolers. So um, there's no escaping great people here in uh, Cascade. As Dennis indicated, back in about 2004-ish, Hewlett Packard was getting ready for the business unit that I was in, the inkjet supplies business unit, which consisted of about 6,000 employees worldwide, um, five factories and research centers around the world, and actually accounted for all of the profitability in Hewlett Packard at the time. Hewlett Packard was a huge company designed so that as organizations brought new product and services to the public, other, pro other organizations would be maturing and other organizations, parts of HP would actually be deteriorating and reformatting. And we were in that position where uh, with the advent of the inkjet supplies or inkjet printers and the supplies that fed those printers, um, we were the most profitable business in HP and probably one of the most profitable businesses in the world at the time. So the combination of the print, inkjet printing business and the inkjet supplies business had come together with the notion of introducing the next generation of inkjet printing platform. It was to be the most um, ambitious product launch in the history of HP. A lot of the executives in HP were very, very nervous because we were putting the business at risk. And so in my role as director of quality and process control, I was very much in the middle I and my team were very much in the middle of trying to determine how we can launch these products in a way that we didn't miss, we didn't fail, we didn't end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, uh, which is what our executives were terrified of. Um, at the same time as we're working through building the quality system to accommodate that launch, we started to receive word and rumors that we were having quality problems with our existing products. Um, tech 
technical marketing or customer service group was indicating a potential systemic problem of higher incidences of quality escalations than we had historically seen. <clears throat> One of the organizations in the business unit was the Worldwide Quality Committee. And so we met monthly from representatives from Corvallis, Oregon, San Diego, California, Puerto Rico, Dublin, Ireland, and Singapore. And we worked on building the quality system for the company and the process control capability. At that month's quality, worldwide quality committee meeting, we talked about these rumors that we were hearing and the conversation came down to three possible scenarios. One, they were just rumors. There really wasn't a problem and we should just stay the course. Two, they were rumors. They were, the rumors were accurate. And one of two things could explain that either something in our quality system was broken or the business had outgrown the quality system and we needed to grow it in order to manage the size business that we were becoming. The quality team uh, initially took the view that, well, the, we hear of these kinds of problems all the time. It's business as usual. There's, there's really not a, a higher incidence of problems. But as we talked more and more and shared information back and forth during that meeting, we, we, I don't know whether we came to the conclusion, but we decided that it was worthwhile investigating so that we could act off data rather than act off assumption. And so uh, a couple of us started to call the front end of the business, the people who are in marketing and sales and customer service to find out, to get firsthand information. <clears throat> and we brought that information to the committee uh, the next month. And it was clear from the data that we had a problem. And the way we brought the information to the committee with the guidance of Dennis was anecdotally and statistically. We counted the number of problems, we counted the number of days between problems and compared that to historical data. We categorized the type of, type of problems that we were seeing and we worked really hard to not only make the data available, but make it actionable so that people in the room could look at the data, understand it, and understand where to go next with whatever capability they had. So out of that meeting, and Dennis joined us at that meeting, it was kind of right in that period where Dennis and I became acquainted. My boss introduced me to Dennis and said, hey, here's a, here's a fellow that's consulting with HP. I think he's got some things that we can learn from. Um, why not you guys, you two sit and chat a little bit. And that was the beginning of our relationship uh, <clears throat> that has just grown and grown and grown and grown in, in all dimensions. So I, I you need to realize I came out of an environment of uh, undergraduate in engineering, uh, master's in business administration, control and command organizations, uh, organizational hierarchy. The managers got the answers, the manager directs. And here I was in a situation with two problems. How do you get this launch done successfully? And it appears we got problems with our existing products. And there's a 6,000 person organization with six sites around the world and most people I've never even seen, much less know them. I don't know where to go to get the answers or even to tell who to do what. And so sitting in this meeting, 
um, <clears throat> we came to the point where we needed to do something and Dennis had suggested that the problems that are in the system are understood by the people in the system and the solutions in the system, the solutions in the organization. And for some reason, that just rang true to me. HP was used to in these kinds of consider in these kinds of situations to launch a hit team, a tiger team of experts. <clears throat> they would pull the best of the best employees together, give them an assignment to go into the organization and solve the problem. And that just it. I've been in other organizations that had done it that way, and it just never seemed to be the right thing to do, and I didn't know why. But we made the decision as a quality team that we weren't going to do that, and that we were going to follow Dennis's guidelines and search for the solutions in the system with the people that were in the system. And we were going to lead with data which really was wonderful because it took all the personalities out of the equation and it let us all sit around the table and look at the data and figure out where we could add value and then go to work on it and it was absolutely amazing how fast the problems were discovered solutions were found solutions were implemented and the problems solved. We went from having a problem, and these are big problems. When you're, when you're mass producing inkjet cartridges at a million cartridges a day off of each line, and you've got a dozen and a half lines around the world, problems can get big really fast. We were experiencing these problems on the average of about once every 20 days. And within really just a very short period of time. The, prob the sol issues were found, problems were solved, solutions were put in place by people that I didn't even know existed. And all of a sudden we started pushing the time between issues out 30 days, 40 days, 70 days, 200 days. And when I left the organization, for another opportunity in HP, we had been two years since the last quality issue had been uh, discovered. So the insights, as, as Dennis and I shared this story with Sebastian, and Sebastian asked, well, what insights did you come away from? What learnings, what growth? The three things came to my mind were lead by data, Keep the study, keep the organization in study mode, keep reflecting. That is a marvelous way to lead. It's, it's a way to lead that's so different from command and control and so healthy, and it creates so much well being. It creates trust in the organization. <clears throat> that that became my second insight was that organizations that have trust within themselves and you can almost you you can substitute the word love basically but organizations with people in you in them that trust each other are are a marvelous place to work bringing a hit team in or a tiger team in to solve a team's and organization's problems is the antithesis of trust. It says to the people who were building the product, who designed the product, who were packaging the product and shipping the product, it says, we don't trust you. We're gonna bring the experts in and they're gonna take over. And, if, and the other way of by releasing the data into the organization and saying, we think you guys are really smart. And if you can see what the issues are, you can fix them. You can find them and fix them. And that's what happened. And so that trust just grew and grew and grew and grew. And then, and that created well being. 
it created, and then the last thing, the result was that the velocity to solution, the velocity of productivity, the velocity of, uh, of the velocity of velocity was just staggering. And the whole thing just felt really, really good. Where, you know, six months earlier, we're sitting in a meeting going, oh my golly, we've got to get these new products launched safely and protect HP, create the future for HP, and solve these problems. We felt confident. We went to work in the morning thinking, I can be successful today. I can enjoy the people that I'm working with, and we can make a difference. And when we left at the end of the day to walk out the parking lot, there was a feeling of accomplishment and a feeling of love for everybody that we'd worked with, whether it was face-to-face -face or over the phone or over a webinar to, with somebody in Dublin or, or Singapore, it didn't matter. We just loved coming to work. We loved working together and we got a lot done. So I'm gonna back off. I don't know how these meetings go from here on, but that's kind of my story. That's kind of Dennis's and my story. Um, we, I think we were catalysts in a really good sense for an organization to do what an organization does best. And I'll just leave it at that. Marvelous, George, thank you. It's so, um, I remember at the time um, George did something also that was really powerful and unusual. Uh, he went to the executives of the organization and he asked them, given that the company's financial health is threatened with these existing quality problems, what should we do? Now, and it just seems so trivial, but most won't do that with their superiors. Most people will act to their bosses in such a way to say, hey, everything's okay. I, I know what the company needs to do. We're good here. And when we're in that kind of environment, we see people being punished for making mistakes. We see people hoarding data because they want to make the good data their own and the bad data someone else's problem. The, the other thing that I remember, and George and I laugh about this still, is here in this crazy time, because the manufacturing of these cartridges were expanding tenfold. At the same time, there was this existential quality problem. I remember I walked by George's cube one day and he just sat smiling. Um, and I, I said, George, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> I was kind of feeling panic, like, shouldn't there be some panic here or, you know, at least uh, busy work? And George um, looked at me, this big old smile, and he said, nah, Dennis, I'm just letting the system take care of itself. And I realized that he was coordinating action in a huge social network. We never could quantify it because it was changing so quickly. And for the students of uh, cultural biology, for those of us who are studying it, my curiosity became is by letting the others appear, by keeping the organization in a reflective conversation, was George expanding the relational behaviors of love that the founders of Hewlett and Packard, Bill and Dave, founded the company upon. Remember, the company was founded on a friendship, not on a business opportunity. And more so, I thought, well, if this network of relational behaviors that were being generated out of love through this constant reflective conversation were going on and our daily living is our knowing, 
remembering that knowing is living, there is this significant social system, a social network arising out of loving behaviors, coordinating action, knowing how to do what could never be done in traditional management literature. That still blows my mind. I, we, we lost count somewhere around 120, 140 people. The number of people in a network of conversations really doesn't matter. It's the relational behaviors that George continued to bring forth by letting the others appear as solvers of a critical quality problem. And, and I've stayed in this curiosity of very, very large social systems that aren't governed in traditional ways, but come forth from people allowing each other to have the freedom to do what's necessary in the moment they find themselves in. And when we reflect on this as it's happening, there's an immense feeling of well-being, living well together. And so what, you know, what are the behaviors that we're seeing? Well, uh, Bill and Dave, uh, early on, 1963, said, we prefer that our company is informal because that's how we like to live with our families, with our friends. We prefer informal settings. Uh, so we like being around a coffee pot and talking. And so Bill and Dave created a company based out of this informal understanding of our humanness. There was respect. I'm not, I respect that you're here to do a good job and that we'll make a big difference together. There is love and support. We have a significant job to do, but if you're down today, I'll help you. I've got plenty of things to do, but if you're calling out for help, then I'm gonna answer that call. So in, in these uh, reflections of George on these insights that came out of saving the company hundreds of millions of dollars, what I realized is that he's maintaining a network of conversations of reflection. Where are we at? Where we want to be? Instead of using positional power, he allowed everyone to appear as they wanted to appear in solving this problem. And out of that, in this huge network of mutual respect, caring for one another, using data to make decisions instead of judgments or opinions or in a window, um, there was tremendous velocity because George had created with his team a new organization based on our loving human nature. And so the productivity measures were off, were outrageous. They're extraordinary. Market analysts said, this is amazing outcome coming out of Hewlett Packard that we would never have expected. So um, I just wanted to, to bring this to light of where we're in now, the world we live in now. How do we organize, mobilize, social networks of relational behaviors grounded in love that we're all living in at the present moment? How do we take care of each other? And in my lifetime, I've never had a single event like the coronavirus unite the whole world. But in cultural biology and in this experience with George, I believe that now we have the wonderful invitation and opportunity 
to realize the power of our loving human nature. So I'm cognizant of the time. I want to sit back and see if you guys have questions or comments. If you're feeling these things in the communities that you're living in, uh, if the loving nature of those around you is becoming more apparent as we survive staying in our homes. So I just would love to open it up. In order to do that and to keep an orderly fashion to be able to listen to you guys, I would like to invite you to write me, Sebastian, if you would like to share something and I can give you the uh, room to uh, give you the access to, to activate your microphone. So if there is someone who would like to participate, please write me on the chat or you also here in in Zoom, you have the choice to raise your hand. And while I receive your uh, desires to participate, I also wanted to add how brilliant and important is these distinctions that you, Dennis and George were making about the extraordinary results in the financial resource that results that this took by the process that you established. And it is what Umberto and Jimena have been telling us for decades. The result of a process is not part of the process itself. And, and, and I can see how George and his team and everybody who was collaborating there, they spontaneously came together, I feel, with this purpose and desire of doing things right, of solving the problems. This is also what Umberto said. Every child and every person wants to do right what they know how to do right. They want to learn this curiosity of keep learning from data, of listening to other as the process, as the manner of behaving. I hear it as well as a regeneration of the HP way that the founders were uh, invited, the, the organization. So how important it is this perspective about process and not be feeling, not allowing the process to be threatened by a re result that will come later, which is the income that it will generate, but just trusting the process. That second insight that George gave us, trust and listening as a manner of behavior, behaving, I think is crucial. And I have here our friend Camila, who I will invite her to join us and to ask this question. Camila? Hello. How are you? I, I, I'm good. I'm standing and it's very good to work and, and listen standing instead of sitting all day long. I've been yeah. in lockdown for almost 10 days now here. Mm. So, Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm an engineer and I was uh, in similar types of projects uh, with Nestle as well in, the, in my previous lifetime. So I, I recognize a lot uh, of, of what you're saying. My, my question is really about reflecting on how to, what, what that means for, for, for today, for what's happening in the world today. Um, first of all, the, the problem is something that we're still trying to grasp. There's a virus, but a lot of us and a lot of different networks are, are, are going beyond what is the real problem. Uh, so there's not really a real problem to, 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 to capture, but perhaps that was also similar uh, in, in, in Hewlett Packard's experience because, well, the results were clear, but the problem was perhaps also different to grasp. So, so my, my question is really to, to better understand the, the, this, this story to, 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 to help us perhaps also better um, see how best we can, we can work today. Uh, trying to contribute, what I'm doing lately is I'm connecting different people and different networks. Uh, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation created by Michel Bowens is, is, is about uh, makers as well and they are connecting a lot of different initiatives on fabricating ventilators and a lot of other things as well and exchanging technology and research 
uh, grassroots level. Uh, today, I also saw a conference of uh, Professor Anil Gupta from the Honeybee Network in India, Frugal Innovation in Ahmedabad, uh, doing so much of the similar things. Connecting uh, is, is the thing that I, that I think is really important. So, 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 so this is indeed what I'm, what I'm really happy about is that hearing Professor Gupta, knowing Michelle Bowens, hearing you, um, the, the talk of love is, is, is important, feelings, uh, connection with nature. Um, the foundations of, 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 uh, are, are very similar, even though sometimes we use different words. How can we, what, what would be the lessons that could help us today in, in, in speed up this bottom-up initiative uh, of, of, of response to today's challenges? Um, because that's, that's there where I think is the similarity. It's about letting, letting, letting appear, um, letting the things go its course to actually be, be solving. So, so how can we nurture this? I, I hope my, my question is clear. Yeah, I, I think you ask the million dollar question. Yes. <laughs> and we live in a world today that there's a lot of barriers in the way of, that get in the way of the sharing um, and the trusting. Here in the United States, we've got a political system that's kind of reverted to territorial wars. Uh, and we could see that in, the, in this package that the government's putting together to try and get assistance to, to the people and businesses so that they can survive during this crisis. And the, the gamesmanship that was going, that has, is going on. Um, between the two different parties. Um, so I think that's one of the huge barriers is that we've built ourselves into a world of left and right, or you're wrong, I'm right, and if I'm right, you can't be right type of a mentality that's kind of structurally getting built in. Um, it's really scary to me. Um, and then at the grassroots level, you see the kind of things that Dennis talked about, which I think more embodies the real human spirit than we see in our leaders. But the leaders are leaders and, and they get in the way. So I think we have problems with discerning between real data and fake data, real news and fake news. We have problems with timing, uh, getting access to news. Um, and in response to that, I think we all feel like the problem is much bigger than any one of us individually can tackle. And we see people getting together in these networks like in India, and Europe, and, and in my little community of uh, you know, 3,000 people, we've got these networks coming together, forming almost spontaneously where the real work is getting done. And so I think when I turn that question and aim it back at myself with the understanding and the experience that I've had over the last 15 years or so, I think my role is one of creating space for honest conversations, creating space for people to get together and share um, their feelings and the, the truth, the data. And when that happens, things seem to get to move forward. So I find myself acting in society here in Cascade very much like I did at HP, being a catalyst, inviting Dennis in um, to apply the principles uh, in board meetings, creating opportunities for everybody to speak with their different viewpoints, and then in a, in a way that's respectful. Um, I, I don't know how else to do it, except what I can 
touch and feel and and then hope that people ex expand on that. So I'll, I'll back away. That's my opinion. Uh, Dennis, what do you think? Well, um, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to be very concrete. So Camilla, one of the things that George and I will do, well, we, we do, we've done a couple of things. Um, uh, George, uh, and the CEO of his organization that he's a trustee for, and I have talked. And we, we talked about bringing some of this practice into their organization. And it's a, a beautiful organization. Uh, and it's very small. And I think to me enjoying getting to know the CEO. So why would I, would I, why would I want to interfere with that relationship by making it a commercial relationship? So the first thing that is occurring for me is we're going to continue to work together because we're friends. Um, Let's put money aside for a while, I guess, is the first wonderful thing I experienced. And the second thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the people that work in the organization, the health care organization, how do they do what they do when they accomplish something that they feel really great about? And this is phenomenal to me <laughs> that George and the CEO are even willing to be in this conversation with me. But that's what we're going to do. Um, we're not going to approach this with a theory or a bias or an expectation. We just generally would like to listen to people explain how do they do what they do when they accomplish things that they feel really great about. And in the experience that we've had together, Sebastian, George, and I, Sebastian and I did this work in a diagnostic uh, infectious disease diagnostic company is in that listening we begin to discover that we prefer to live well together and what are those preferences they're regular comments that people make about living well together we like freedom we like to support one another we like mutual respect this isn't coming from a abstract theory. This is coming from listening to them, all of them, and then going back to them and saying, this is what we heard. Is, is this, was our hearing good? <laughs> is this valid? And then we know how we do our best work. And then we trust that we will deal with the virus. But we keep it really lean. <laughs> in terms of distraction we don't we don't enter into the conversation and say boy here i am you're a big problem and i'm here to help <laughs> mm -hmm. um and george does this so very well and you think about what he has shared with us today what's at stake in his community now and how he's maintaining or conserving those insights that he shared with us it's just it's phenomenal so concretely this is what we'll do we'll allow the others to appear by listening to them i i realize that with the comparison with uh with these initiatives that are coming up bottom up is that through social media everybody has that space to express themselves by nature intrinsically because we're not part of an organization and all these barriers, it's something you said, George, it's about lowering, understanding the barriers and lowering them. That's exactly what, what these initiatives are about, understanding and, and helping people, bring food to people, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Camila. Thank Dennis and George. And now I have the privilege to continue letting appear others in this space. So, Carol, you wanted to ask a comment i'm going to give you the audio and there you are i'm going to put you on video spotlight okay hello uh -oh. carol 
Hello. <laughs> Hi. No, mine was just an observation and a comment that kind of glued together what Dennis was talking about and what George was talking about. And that is when people are not afraid, when positional power is absent, then data is accurate. And then you can actually make the kind of decisions that you need to make and, and you can deal with the kind of problems that you're dealing with accurately. And so I think that's so important. That's something right now that's missing for us in the US that the, we're not getting good data. People are afraid to actually um, go against positional power. And, and you can just see how detrimental that is to the system's ability to actual, or even an individual's ability to actual re, actually respond to what's going on. So I, that was just an observation. Really wise. Yes, and, and, and I believe that that has also been here in Spain, <laughs> one of the main critical factors that we have experiencing here and in many other countries. Yeah. That has been a tough one. Yeah, it is. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, George, Dennis, would you like to add something else or shall I invite to our next guest? Yes, so I have the privilege to put here on the air our Aussie friend, Tony Carew. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie, and thank you, George, and um, I really appreciate that story. Um, my, my thoughts, um, and reflections around what you were sharing is is about the coming together of people. And I like what Carol was sharing about, you know, positional power. But I often hear in organisations and in the community, you know, like I, I am my role, um, but I tend to go and it's helpful to go beyond the role and tap into people's humanity and their individuality that they all bring different um, observations and distinctions into a conversation and I heard that that was happening uh, for, you know in Hewlett Packard and, and and I think that some of the problems that were experienced were, were, were maybe not problems to start off with there was a phenomena happening that wasn't producing the desired result but through conversation of the many different bringing together of people then the problems um, arose. They, they were allowed to be revealed in conversation and, and then the solutions um, in shared understanding found their way um, into the workings and the, the practices of people who then manipulated the technology and the machinery to do that. And with, you know, with that distinctions, I, I bring it back into what's happening here in Australia, I'm guessing similarly around the world as well, where there's not a lot we can do. We're still working out what this, what this thing, this phenomena of uh, you know, COVID-19 is, but we do see the impact. We do feel uh, people's experience of this and their own interpretation, their own experience, their own facticity. And based on the principles that you have introduced, George, is that coming together, even in our families, um, our friends, our community through Zoom technology or other ways because of the isolation and just creating that social space for people to share, bring their own distinctions in and, and to allow new practices to emerge for us as solutions to help us overcome perhaps fear or anxiety could be really helpful because then it's in the sphere of our influence and we can be together in that consensual space of love and legitimacy. Um, so that's what I was sitting here uh, with Dennis and George as you were sharing. How do I um, interpret you know, that experience and bring that into the experience that I um, can achieve in some way through conversation that I feel empowered to do um, with other people who, uh, who are like-minded. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. You're Thanks, welcome. Tony. I, I, I've uh, 
what I like um, about what you said, Tony, is uh, it's this feeling I have of the background of caring, loving, supporting uh, our family and friends. And I say it was in the background because we've always said career is first. So it's not only organizational positional power, but it's where I work. Mm -hmm. And then I go home to these things that, I, that are really important to me. And what I hear you saying that's uh, fascinating, Tony, is now the background has become the foreground. Mm -hmm. And what used to be in the foreground, consumerism, greed, competition, um, deceit, has gone into the background. And so in this moment that we're living in, what we see is our wonderful capacity to love and care for one another. And that uh, being in the foreground can generate tremendous productivity and velocity mm. in solving this problem. Mm. So thank you for that, Tony, because it's a reminder to me that I have an opportunity to not only tell my grandson, mm. geez, I miss, watching you play baseball four times a week, but also say, are you noticing how people are caring for one another? Mm. You know, I'm noticing you caring for some friends that need help right now. Mm. A really wonderful Tony. Mm. You're welcome, Dennis. And I, you know, I think it's, it is revealing um, our taken for grantedness in these moments it's it's always been there and i love what you say the background has now become the foreground and it's a it's allowing us to see what we have been taking for granted and and what we can appreciate and what we can reattune ourselves to in these moments mm -hmm. so thank you absolutely oh you're very welcome thank you very much and th this also brings me back to a reflection that i that i saw uh, here in the chat mm. about how can we invite people across the world who feel like their work isn't as important as someone of higher mm. position to be inspired. We, I think we have a global problem and we, are, we, and we need to generate local actions. Uh, at this moment, this is a global problem we're facing, but the actions that we must, that we can take are around us, are in our communities, in our families, with the people who behave. Because in order to generate this big cultural change, there is first the need for this individual transformation. Mm -hmm. So if we do not get this awareness about the situation in which we are as a, as a species, as humankind, if we do not become aware that listening and trusting begins by me, if we do not distinguish that collaborating across networks implies my, my actions, we cannot generate transformation even if we are in a high position or in a lower position. It's a manner of behaving in realizing our living together. So I feel that for inviting others to generate those transformations, to also be inspired, is to be that change, to be that transformation in whatever we do. And on that note, about giving space and letting appear, we have our friend Ward from Mount Madonna, who I will also invite here to share some questions and reflection with us. We will see what it is. Hello, Ward. Hello. Um, this is lovely, thank you all. Um, the work that I've been doing uh, has to do with uh, exploring education and trying to point towards uh, the, the importance of the implicit curriculum rather than the explicit curriculum. And I was triggered a moment ago by the comment that essentially that when background becomes foreground, the implicit uh, becomes explicit. And so I think maybe what's happening in this dynamic 
uh, is the opportunity for the implicit to become explicit, which is uh, trying to understand how our humanness is impacted by our lack of sense of process and the resultant relationships and the whole HP story was one that was driven by establishing a humanizing process rather than a dehumanizing process. And uh, the result of that was uh, community, friendship, uh, and a constituency, a constituent productivity and I guess from, from my perspective, uh, that's a very yogic concept, which is that you do the action for its own sake and the result takes care of itself. Um, when you men mentioned that, I think Dennis, that struck me. And so I'm trying to understand the impact of education on our humanness and ultimately the evolution of the species to determine whether the explicit process of driving content and the lack of awareness around process and the relationships that are developed through process, how that's affecting our society, our environment, our relationships, and ultimately our humanness. So uh, I just had a moment where suddenly I saw a wonderful intersection. Uh, with the process that I'm in. So thank you very much. I have, a little bit, <clears throat> I have a little bit of personal experience there in our family. Uh, we have five kids and they have kids and so I'm watching grandkids grow up and and then my siblings have similar sized families. Um, and I've been intrigued with the success of my sister's work at homeschooling, which has on perp which has purposefully not used the production line mode of education, but has more um, relied on innate curiosity and following that curiosity to wherever it takes you and getting the learning out of that. And then what are we curious about next? And it's really interesting because when, you, when you're curious about the sky, for example, astronomy, it leads to a need to understand mathematics and to understand physics and science. And so that curiosity pulls all these things in. And the result now, she, my sister has now five children that have um, gone through that homeschooling program and on into university. The first child had a really tough time, even though she scored magnificently on the entrance exams and the standardized tests to get into university. Um, she had a really tough time getting in. Um, and now her, her last children, so the children have kind of have a 15 year journey. Uh, now her last couple of children, the universities have come to them and said, we are having really good success with, with children who have gone through homeschooling. And we are recruiting, actively recruiting homeschoolers. So the, the stage for acceptance of homeschoolers through that different kind of educational experience has been staggering. Amazing what happens when we leave our children's humanness in, intact. And Humberto deals with that a lot uh, in biology of love and with uh, from being to doing and, and um, in, in many ways, it changed uh, my thinking and philosophy about education and boiled it down to one question, what am I conserving in my manner of living with my students? Yeah. Yep. And so, um, uh, Ward, in, in your uh, reflection here, I also see um, 
it becoming an answer of the question that was asked. What, what about the people who feel that they're not as important? You know, the people right now that we depend on to live. Right? The people running our sanitation departments, the people that are growing our food, the cooks that are cooking our food, education. The that are bringing us our food. Uh, yes, exactly. So education has also been uh, a process of children understanding who's important and who isn't. And again, in this foreground background is happening, Uh, I'll be honest with you, um, I don't really care a whole lot about what happens to airlines because I don't plan to get, but I care a whole lot about the cooks and the folks that are holding the community together, who frankly, in response to that question that Sebe had asked, they've been told that, that they are not important. And it's just a wonderful time to say, how silly of us. My iPhone just really doesn't taste quite as good as the fresh greens coming from Penny's Market around the corner. Mm -hmm. And I can feel her love and caring for us when she calls and says, I know you like black elderberry because it supports your immune system. So I got a special box just for you over here. Mm. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> right on thank so you there, huh? uh, there's just a question that i that has entered up most of my conversation is what is the opportunity here and i heard that throughout the day of looking at what the opportunity is um and uh i, I think there is a, you're naming an opportunity of to understand have a new understanding of what matters hmm. Yes, and also bringing also the awareness to what the dog invites us to see, which understanding is behavioral transformation. Keeping the understanding as behavioral transformation in what we do on a daily basis. So now, dear friends, dear Wednesday Talks community, uh, I wanted to mention to you that we are about to get to the end of our call, but we are not leaving without listening to Alicia, who had some uh, reflection he would like to share or a question with us. And also, I wanted to let you know, you will all receive an email. In that email, first, you will find a link to a YouTube video where you will be able to watch uh, the session we had last week with Umberto, and that's a good one. Second, you will receive a link to enroll for our next Wednesday talk, which will be when? Next Wednesday, that's right. <laughs> next Wednesday, 7 p.m. CET. And also, uh, because I love all of you guys, I will also throw a few informations from Matristica for you to have there, which are special discounts for the training programs. And that will be it. And Please remember booking your calendar every Wednesday, at least through March, April, and May. We will be participating in this space. And if you have something cool that you would like to share or to present as a topic for one of our Wednesday, you are most than welcome to write me so we can cook something up there and create a beautiful space like this. And after talking that much, please, Alicia, save us with your reflection. Alicia? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to say, as I, I wrote for you on the chat, that to me, the change, as if, I don't know, it's a sentence that's been mainly used, but at least, at least if, uh, no, just a sec. <laughs> Unless that we do it ourselves, I mean, the change comes from our inner work. If we want someone in the uh, in a company to 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 thrive, for example, and express him or herself, we need to create that space, that environment, that trusting environment for that person to do it. 
that's why you were talking about trusting, 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 and, and create this um, kind of like loving environment. And this, I, because I'm, I work in the environmental field, so the only thing that I can see from what is happening is that nature is the reflection in the sense that we are nature at the end of the day. And nature is prosperous, nature is a loving space, and that's what we are, but we are lost in what we are. So for me, it's like just looking at nature and learning from nature, and then from there we can build our system, which is inside the system that already is in place on Earth. Mm. And to me, it, it would go from a jump from sustainable system a prosperous system that's all thank you thank you mm -hmm. oh okay sorry i have mm -hmm. to step in on this one because i i resonate deeply with what you mentioned alicia uh, i don't know well i had the privilege but then i realized it wasn't much of a privilege of participating in cop 25 here in madrid it was a privilege because it's an important situation in which big negotiations happen but it was not a privilege because I witnessed the lack of disposition to take ethical actions and ethical negotiations around what is happening to climate. We as human species, we are freaking out about coronavirus, but the impact that climate emergency is having in contrast to what the coronavirus is doing is huge. We have not come to realize as a human species now that we are the present of 3.5 million years of conservation of the human lineage. And we have failed to be aware and to incorporate in our actions the responsibility that we have to continue preserving our living and the living of the rest of the biosphere. So when I hear Alicia inviting us to see to nature, to understand their dynamics and their processes, I, I, I feel the invitation to first, the humbleness that we humankind need to have, but also understanding that we belong to a greater system that holds us. The biosphere doesn't give the, the biosphere doesn't care about us. We are the only ones who can, who can care about us and about the biosphere. So I believe that it's also crucial, this invitation that Alicia makes us because nature has been a great and very patient teacher for us human beings for many years. And I believe that it's time for us now to start listening, trusting, and collaborating with her as well. So thank you, Alicia. You're welcome. And we ran out of time, but we will be back. So thank you very much to all of you for being here. You will receive the email as I promise. Our good friend Marcelo will take care of it. And I'm so happy that we are kind of creating this little community that we will be meeting here on Wednesday. And I especially would like to thank George uh, for coming here, for sharing this story, which is sharing a little bit or a piece of his living as well. So there is also a, an element of, of being grateful and privileged for listening to, to that, and especially the insights that we got from it. And my buddy Dennis as well, over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, I don't know if you would like to say a closing statement. No. No? no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you said it all. <laughs> so, thank you very much. We we'll see you on next Wednesday. And please remember, if you would like to present your brief space of your life, or an idea or something that could create a good Wednesday talk, write me and we'll be seeing you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you.